hi everyone it's Andrea uh, welcome to the channel so some of you colouring guys have said that you would be interested in seeing what I was reading and what I was planning on reading so today I'm doing a very small back to booktube haul uh, the plan is that with booktube I will probably make one video a week which will be a Friday reads so it'll be made on a Thursday and uploaded on a Friday what I'm planning to read over the next week what I'm currently reading, what I'm planning on reading. And then either weekly or monthly wrap ups, depending on how many books I read. So for instance, in February, you'll be seeing this hopefully on March the 1st, as long as I can get it edited and uploaded with the weekly vlog. Um, I've actually read 22, 21, 22 books. That's gonna be quite a long video. So what I'm gonna do is if it seems to be that it's gonna be getting to that sort of length, I'll split it down into weeks. However, there will be a haul if I buy any books. Now, I've got eight books that I've bought in the last month or so to show you. So, I'm going to start with those. So, you'll have to excuse me, I haven't got my tripod up here. I'm balancing the camera on a copy of Can't Buy Me Love, which is a Beatle book on the Beatles, obviously. So, the first book I got to show you is The Green Mile by Stephen King. This is the anthology of the six books together because it was originally published in six weekly installments much like they did back in uh, times of Charles Dickens he used to they were serialized but this is the anthology of all of uh, the stories together and this was for February's uh, read a readathon um, the Stephen King read along that Missy over at Binge Readers is doing she does one every year I did it for a couple of years then I had Jennifer and I just couldn't read very much this is the first year I've really started reading well again um, so this is Green Mile we all know the story of this this is the story of um, Edgecombe who works at uh, a prison on the Green Mile which is Death Row and it's the story of a man named John Coffey who's convicted of killing two little girls and he comes he, he's brought into the prison and it turns out that he has this amazing healing gift where he can remove the the pain and the illness from a person and let it out into the atmosphere and um, what happens to him and uh, Edgecombe and all the other people um, involved in the prison is in this book it was made into a film starring Tom Hanks as Edgecombe I love the film and I love the book and I think the film did do the book justice it's a little bit different it's going to be but it's not so different that you think huh like with Dreamcatcher, which was last month's Stephen King read. I've, I saw the film and I didn't understand the film, but the read the book and that made sense, so. But yeah, The Green Mile. So the uh, next book is another Stephen King one. This is the Backerman books. And uh, so this is Stephen King writing as Richard Backerman, his pen name. There's three stories in this one and I'm just gonna have to find out is, uh, we've got The Long Walk, Roadwork and The Running Man. The pick for March is uh, The Long Walk, uh, a chilling look at the ultra-conservative America of the future, where a grueling 450-mile marathon is the ultimate sports competition. So that is March's pick. As this is an anthology, again, of three of the Bacamoa books, I'll probably just continue to read the other two, even though they're not part of the readathon. Uh, Roadwork, an immovable man refuses to surrender to the irresistible Irresistible Force of Progress, and of course The Running Man, TV's future favourite game show where contestants are hunted to death in an attempt to win a one billion dollar jackpot. Of course this was in the 80s made into a film starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and again I love the film. I, I know a lot of people don't particularly like the film but I absolutely love The Running Man film. I've got it on DVD, it's one of my favourite films. I haven't watched it for a while so I'll be interested to see how it compares to the book. So that one as well to add to my small but growing Stephen King library. Next I've got a couple of Jack the Rippers. I've got The Crimes of Jack the Ripper by Paul Rowland. This is a big A4 sized book which is not going to fit on the Jack the Ripper shelf and uh, it's got um, photographs of various people including um, the suspects, drawings from the time, photos from the time, um, Yes, pictures of the victims, sadly. So that's a, a, a big one. So another one to add to my Jack the Ripper library. I'm currently only buying books that I'm going to keep, which is why it's going to be small hauls of five or six or seven, possibly like eight this month. 
so obviously i do collect books on jack the ripper i got another one coming in march it's on its way but there's that one another one i got is jack the ripper unmasked by william beadle the real identity of the world's most infamous killer is revealed at last and i'm sure it's not Modern profiling provides the tools to identify Jack the Ripper. An American study of 36 sexually motivated killers found that 86% came from stable economic backgrounds and 80% of the offenders possessed average or above average intelligence. But every killer experienced a significantly malfunctioned family unit during childhood. Failings included alcohol or drug abuse, sexual difficulties, insanity and criminal behaviour. If the FBI had been hunting Jack the Ripper, they would have referred to him simply as an unsub, meaning unknown subject the agency's standard term for an unnamed offender. We need to trawl the pro profiles deeper and darker waters to pinpoint a genuine suspect. We're looking for somebody who's mentally ill, but not noticeably so, who knows that what he's doing wrong, but needs to do it and is capable of functioning routinely in society from day to day without ever being properly integrated part of it. So yeah, another one for the Ripper Library. No idea what this is like. It's written by um, William Beadle, who was at the time of writing chairman of the Whitechapel Society, 1888, the Forum for Students of Jack the Ripper Murders, a member of Mensa and the Dealey Plaza Kennedy Assassination Society and the Richard III Society. There you go. Well, most of these are non-fiction. In fact, Stephen King ones are the only fictional books in this hall. Next. I saw this book on Steve Donahue's channel. He's got hardback from The Brattle. I've got a paperback from eBay, which is a bit worse where and this is the titanic conspiracy as you can see i'm already reading this one um yeah by robin gardner and dan van der Vaart. yeah it's all about the conspiracy theories surrounding the titanic the why so many people cancelled their journeys at the last minute why uh, there's a hole near the bow why did smith accelerate into it why is the wreck irreconcilable with Titanic's final SOS was it replaced by the Olympic in the last minute no it wasn't it really wasn't it's Titanic down there but I said it because Steve bought it I thought it sounded like a good laugh when he mentioned it not laugh because that's the wrong thing to say about a disaster that claims so many lives but I thought it'd be an interesting read it is actually very interesting but I'll talk about that more when I've finished it and with that book, because I've got two books, I've also got the story of the wreck of the Titanic, the ocean's greatest disaster, a 19, it says 1912 memorial edition. Obviously, this is not published in 1912. They've got some uh, photographs in there. Uh, 1998, this was uh, published, but it was originally published in 1912. So it'll be interesting to read um, what there is. So there's things like... Uh, Let's have a look. There are witness, uh, witnesses of, of the sinking, so from the, the survivors, all sorts. There's photographs of them. There's the lyrics to the song Near My God to Thee, which is said that the band were playing as the ship sank. Uh, Titanic lifeboat being hoisted up to the Carpathia with the uh, some of the survivors in it, and so on. So as this comes, from, as this was originally published in 1912, um, this is the nearest you'll get to actually be in there now, so that would be interesting. Next I got one of the Images of America books that I like so much. This one's by Julie Lugo Carrera and Mark Wanamaker. Movie Cities, Movie Studios of Culver City. So as you know I am into the movies, I love old Hollywood. And this um, talks about the three major studios in Culver City at the time of Hollywood uh, starting up and some of the smaller ones. So the three major ones were two by Thomas Ince and Hal Roach. So the two Thomas Ince studios, the first one he built became the very famous MGM lot. Now it's Sony, Sony Pictures. So it takes you through that. Thomas Ince building it, it becoming the next one and the next one and MGM and on and on. Uh, the second studio built became Archeopathé and then later Desilu and so on and so on. And, and that would have been the studio that uh, Marilyn Monroe, as a young girl's Norma Jean, would have looked out of the orphanage window and saw the water tower for, she saw the water tower for RKO pictures and that would have been that one and again uh, those two are still in existence, those two studios are still working studios. The last one, the Hal Roach Studios are no longer there, there is a plaque there and it's got photographs of the studios being built in operation 
are being destroyed and actually this picture here of this young man which you can't see very well um that is the author mark, mark wanamaker he puts together a lot of these uh, hollywood related uh, images of america i've got three now and i'm slowly every now and building them up they are quite pricey they're around 17 pound in the uk but this one was uh, reduced to 12 for some reason so i picked it up and the last book i got is a very small book it's called the shakespeare miscellany it's by david crystal and ben crystal ben crystal's his son um now david crystal is a um linguist and uh ben is an actor and they do some great videos on youtube they they talk about what is known as shakespeare's original pronunciation so i discovered this sort of not this but ben and david crystal by watching a video on youtube that was called something like how far could you go back in time in and still be able to be understood in england um and it is quite far back you could go back to shakespearean time and you would sort of about get the gist but they they pronounce things differently than we do now now we watch shakespeare it's done in rp which is received pronunciation which is how the queen speaks not taking the Mickey Majesty just to explain how the sounds. Um, but this is more about how they would have pronounced it back in the day, um, which would have been in their normal accents. They wouldn't have put on this posh voice. It would have just been done. And if you listen to OP and if you, you go on and you type in Shakespeare original pronunciation, you will come across it an open university video um, with them both in it. It's really, really interesting. They do bits of it in RP and in the OP and you can see how much more the OP makes sense and the, the accent is sort of a mix of American, West Country, Irish, Welsh, you can hear all the Northern, you can hear because his actors would have come from Wales and Ireland and the North and the West Country and then of course they would have moved to America when it was discovered, those sorts of people when we emigrated across to the States. So you can see how the American accent developed from excuse me <coughs> the regional accents now they've got quite a few books out but I thought this would be quite interesting is that why is there a curse on one of Shakespeare's plays which subjects did he study at school why did Romeo and Juliet nearly have a happy ending why was acting banned in Shakespeare's hometown how many words did he invent and who was the first actor to play Hamlet it says on here the Shakespeare miscellany is an illuminating and endlessly absorbing treasury of observations about the world's greatest writer compiled by the authors who brought, your sh brought you Shakespeare's words linguist David Crystal and actor Ben Crystal bring together little known facts and intriguing insights into the plays and poems as well as essential information about the man behind them and the dynamic Elizabethan theatrical world in which he worked so they've got quite a few books out and I will be getting some more of them at some point but I thought I'd start with this one because I find it fascinating. So if you're interested in how um, Shakespearean accents would have been and how they would have pronounced words, because it was completely different, go in and sh go put in Shakespeare original pronunciation into YouTube and you'll pull up some videos. Very fascinating to hear it. And how the jokes make more sense. That Like the Jake speech in As You Like It makes more sense in... OP than it does in RP you know because he's called the melancholy Jakes he's miserable yet he says that this guy told him a joke and he laughs for an hour but you hear it in the RP it makes no sense you know and thereby hangs a tell and you're like oh well but in the OP it makes more sense so those are the eight books that I bought I have read a couple of them so you will probably you will see some of them well two of them at least in my um reading wrap up like i said it's going to be very long so i do apologize i've read a lot of books on my phone on, my, on the kindle app because i i find that's the best way to read with when jennifer's sitting on me so what i will do when i'm i'm putting that together is i will either have the kindle fire with the pictures on it or I will edit them into the video. I'll put the pictures on in the corner up here somewhere when I do it. Obviously not now because I've just shown you real books. Um, not real books, they're all real books, but physical copies that, like I said, I'm only buying books that I'm going to keep because I do have several hundred books. 
and I've got loads to get rid of so you'll be only seeing book hauls that feature Hollywood films, Marilyn Monroe, history, whether it's Titanic, Jack the Ripper, Ancient Egypt, Hollywood books, some fiction, yes, because Stephen King, Andrew Cartmel, if he's doing Vinyl Detective, Jodie Taylor, there's a few of them that I do collect. But generally there's not going to be many book hauls. I'm not going to be spending a lot of money on stuff that I read once and then I get rid of. Um, but this I will dip into now and then, and the Jack the Ripper I will read again, Titanic ones I will read again because I love it, anything to do with history and uh, stuff like that. So I hope you've enjoyed looking at these eight books with me. I will see you in a couple of days with my haul, oh, not my haul, with my um, monthly wrap up. It might take me a couple of days to film because I might have to do it in bits because I don't get a lot of time to do the filming and I've still got a lot of colouring videos to do. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing the books that I'm going to be getting to in the next few months because I'm not going to read, read them all in one go, there's too many of them. Um, and I will see you very soon in another video and I have no idea what it could be. It could be a canon video, it could be another book video, obviously a weekly vlog. <laughs> As I say, I love making videos and I love talking to you guys and I'm really excited to get back into reading. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to sharing what I think about the books that I've read in February. Like I said, there's 22 of them, I think. So I will see you in the next video. Bye guys.